All right, uh, so hello and welcome uh, to uh, my Facebook Live uh, Digital Strategy. Uh, today I'm actually with a main guest uh, who I'll introduce very, very shortly. Um, and uh, he's one of the leading experts in personal branding and digital marketing and all that kind of stuff. So my amazing counterpart, uh, Ampa. Um, again, I'll introduce him now in a moment or so, but first, uh, let's get things rolling. I would just talk about what's really important in terms of uh, building a solid personal brand, uh, some of the challenges that you might be facing to close from a business and what you should focus on uh, to help you overcome them. And um, as I mentioned, attention to personal branding may have a bigger impact uh, than you realize. Alex is here to, to, to uh, walk us through that. So welcome to the Digital Leadership Breakthrough Show. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Tim Bueller. My goal is to help you better understand and pursue what matters most in your business and how to make a difference in your personal strategy, enhancing and increasing your leadership. Um, so today, in today's show, I'm talking with Alex Rodriguez, um, who is head of Yummy Marketing. You'll have to correct me on that. Is it YMMY or Yummy? I love both. <laughs> and uh, author of the book, on, um, uh, Digital Bacon, Make Your Online Presence Irresistibly Attractive. So welcome to the show, Alex. Thanks for coming. Thank you for the invitation, Doyle. It is always yeah. a pleasure. It always is intellectually stimulating to talk to you, and I look <laughs> forward to nothing less today. Yeah, yeah, no, cool. Thank you for taking the time out of your day and uh, wanting to talk about the digital and business and strategy. And, and I know we've talked a lot before, but uh, we want to kind of go on a different path today and uh, talk about the attention economy and personal branding and that sort of thing. So quickly, first, just a little bit of an introduction uh, from yourself. Yeah, as you mentioned, I lead creative and strategic efforts here at Yummy Marketing. We are a creative digital firm, and we help businesses raise their visibility, evolve their brand, and attract more business uh, through creativity and strategy. Um, we have been around for four years, four and a half years. I have been in the industry for over 22 years myself, uh, creating, developing successful online experiences for large brands such as Disney, Busch Gardens, uh, AB InBev, and many others. Uh, many of those experiences have generated millions of dollars in sales in a record period of time uh, and have won several awards in advertising and social media and others. Um, I, you know, one of the things that prompted me to get into business was seeing the uh, digital landscape. And I think you and I have a lot of commonality in that. And that there's a lot of exaggeration and misinformation in this space. So we try to give a kind of a down-to-earth approach, a grounded approach in what we do, uh, never exaggerating the facts, but going for the best results with a real-world approach, always being serious, ethical, and accountable with what we do. And this is why our clients feel like we are a partner by their side. We're part of their company. Uh, it's more of a partnership model than a just a vendor model for us. So this is what we do. And uh, and as you mentioned, I um, have uh, my book, Digital Bacon, is has been published in English and in Spanish, uh, both reaching Amazon bestseller status in four different categories in both languages. Uh, beginning of this year, I published another small ebook. It was it's five fresh ideas to dominate digital advertising, and uh, and I'm about to publish my next book, which I haven't announced the title just yet. But many of the topics that we're going to discuss today uh, are directly out of this new book that's coming up. Oh, fantastic! And, and can you give us a quick little insight or? Well, yes. Uh, I, I don't want to get too much ahead of ourselves because it's going to be a lot of what we're going to talk about. But but my, my, my book is oriented uh, towards consultative professionals um, on how to uh, develop a solid profile, a solid uh, personal brand, but with the goal, specific goal of closing more sales. Not to become a celebrity or to uh, to be more famous or anything like that, but specifically yeah. how personal branding ties into selling more, selling more easily, and growing our businesses. That's my focus in this book, and uh, is what I believe how this all this conversation all connects to the importance in our business, what we're focused on as business business owners and entrepreneurs. So, what is that based on? Like a, a couple of days we, we were talking about earlier, I was talking about. 
sort of serendipitously on Monday in my digital strategy session about the attention economy. So, mm -hmm. and there seems to be a lot of tie-ins here as well. Like, like what, what, or what are we talking about here? Yes, absolutely. So that is one of the foundational ideas in the book. And as you spoke about, and you linked to some awesome uh, research material, which I didn't even know about. So that was very helpful for me. But um, I believe that in all kind of in different parts of the world, we're just sort of observing a trend. And it's this trend about this attention economy. Now, I call it attention as currency. I go one step further, because if you look at human attention, it has or it can be attributed the uh, traits of a currency system. So a currency system is in limited supply. It can be exchanged for value uh, and and uh, many other traits. One of them is actually it can be counterfeited. You know, I mean, you can you can you know do bad things with currency like steel. Uh, and we're seeing that trend as well. If you're in the United States, you can see that there this term fake news is becoming one of the most you know most uh, searched for and, you know, uh, these terms that are really concerning, you know, is shaking the foundation of uh, entities that are, are in charge of distributing information such as Google, Facebook and others. And this term of fake news is a counterfeiting in, in uh, is cheating on your attention as currency. So it's cheating you. It's making you pay attention to something that's not worthwhile. So this whole thing about attention as currency, I think it's a valuable uh, uh, analogy for two reasons. Number one, to, for us to be to, to realize the value that our attention has so that we may focus on more valuable experiences. So when you realize that your attention, your daily attention, actually has an economic value in the marketplace, now you can be more selective and more responsible on where you decide to focus your attention every day. In yeah. fact, yeah. and here's a, here's a mind-blowing thing. If people go, maybe go after the interview, but if you visit basicattentiontoken.com, dot com uh, dot org sorry basic attention token dot org org you will see that there is a group of founders that is actually trying to build a cryptocurrency based on human attention so in fact they're trying to place human attention give it a market value to human attention in such a way that advertisers and publishers can bid for that currency and people like you and I, we can assign a value. Like if I pay attention to your advertiser, mm -hmm. that deserves a retribution in BAT, in basic attention token. Yeah. So it's a very interesting yeah. movement that's happening right now. And the second one, just to finish my, my participation, the second uh, thing that, you know, uh, topic that, that this sort of makes us conscious of is how we garner other people's attention. And this is the focus of, I think, most of our conversation today is, when we see other people's attention as currency, now we need to work on more and more valuable investments for them to, to pitch to them to say, hey, pay attention to me because I have something that is worth our exchange of your attention versus my valuable experience. Yeah. So it's almost like we're able, you're able to um, quantify it, really, is really what you're, you're saying is you sort of look at it as a, as a currency. You we're know. certainly moving towards that. Yeah. Okay, so that's how far away are we from actually fully quantifying that? Are we kind of just obviously early steps? Yeah, absolutely. It's in the early steps. And this, you know, what I mentioned before, the basic attention token is one of those efforts to do that. And it may or may not succeed. It's very early right now. But the fact that people are paying attention and saying, listen, our human attention is in limited supply and let's make better use of it. Um, is a very telling signal because I've been in advertising for a quarter of a century, almost a quarter of a century, and we never really? considered this. <laughs> yeah, I am kind of old. I just turned 42 last week. And we never really talked about human attention in this manner. It was usually regarded as something unlimited. Um, it's something taken for granted. Oh, we'll just put blasts, you know, ads on TV and people will watch them. You know, it was just, you know, kind of, you know, take it for granted, just as I said. And now we're seeing that is in more and more limited supply. And as you said in your previous live video, which I watched, which was great, um, it's also uh, highly competed for. So many, many yeah. people from different directions are trying to trade and compete for that limited attention, um, <clears throat> which which uh, mentioned, it was just teaches us that we need to compete in a smarter and smarter manner in this whole exchange of, of human attention. Yeah, that's kind of, 
where it leads us to next is if we're able to sort of qualify a little bit. How do we, and we, I mean, we only have a 24 hours every day and we're kind of all competing for the same thing, but how do you start to create these valuable experiences that, that people will then tune in or tune out? Yeah, man, I, I think the main thing to begin with is to understand that value of human attention. <laughs> when we understand that other people have this, uh, their attention and limited supply, I think that causes us uh, who are sort of competing and trying to get that human attention from them, it causes us to think about these things twice. So what kind of news or what, what kind of information and I, am I going to spread? Uh, every, every piece of, it, of information that we distribute is a pitch for other people's attention. So when we understand that this is a very delicate economy, it's a very delicate exchange, then once we do that, we will number one move away from these uh, these experiences and this you know sharing uh, news and and pieces of, of of content that is really not worthwhile for us, um, and I think that doesn't have any connection to what we do as a business. And number two, I think it'll help us curate the type of information that we share and we pass along to others uh, because we will think about it twice. We'll say, well, listen. If, if I think a helpful thought is, if I only had one shot for people to pay attention to me, what would I do with that one shot? Hmm? If I only had one opportunity for people to hear my message, how well would I use this opportunity? Now, this is not to lead us to, into desperation or anything like that, but just to think about you know, respecting other people and, and not participating in just spreading mm -hmm. you know, words for words sake. Yeah. I was just going to say, like, like that's kind of where we are now, and we're just flooded with, with content, and everybody wants to share this and share that, and Absolutely. not understanding that, well, you have to be a bit more selective. But isn't that kind of contrary a little bit um, to what, you know, people are saying is that they're being bombarded, obviously, but then they're also sort of raising the issue, well, I don't want to be, you know, tracked either um, with my behaviors and where I'm going so that... The message, really, of marketing is, is you're able to narrow it, in my mind at least. You're able to message specific people if you know what they're doing, what their interests are, as opposed to just kind of flooding anything and hoping something will stick. I don't know. There's, there seems to be like two competing factions here. <laughs> yeah, no, I, th I, think, I think you're onto something, and it's, it's, it's certainly, um, you know, it's not about, you know, it's, 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 <laughs> it's as much about what you choose to communicate as what you uh, decide not to communicate, you know? Um, and, and, and I think that's where you're going with that thought is that, you know, you, you narrow down to the particular interests of the people that you are yeah. trying to, to reach. And that all has to do with the research that you do uh, into who, you, who is your ideal audience? Who do you ideally want to be in touch with? Uh, that will resonate with your message and not just your business message, you know, who's going to, you're going to be your buyer. But, but the, the fact of the matter is that you also have a story, you have a set of values, you have, have a set of uh, uh, attributes and aspects that other people can align with. Um, and that's the type of person that you should be talking instead of that broad spread that you were criticizing last time. Right. Yeah, no, for sure. And then, then it comes down to, I mean, yes, identifying your proper audience, but, um, uh, you talk a bit about you know creating a valuable experience. Like like, how do you actually do that? Yeah, the, it, creating a valuable experience is is all about you know going deep into what your audience deems as value uh, as valuable. I should say. So um, you know maybe we should go into the um, the what we're what I call kind of the four challenges when you're developing your personal brand. Uh, and one of them is that it is just, it's, it's just not attractive enough. You know, when you, when you put out a personal brand that is not attractive, it's irrelevant to people. Um, what it means is that you're not connecting with the type of person that you are looking to connect with. So for example, I see so many times professions and you know what I'm not going to call them out what what type of professional it is I do call them out in the book though but here okay. for the sake of peace I'm not going to call out one professional <laughs> but let's say let's just say you're in a profession where you're trying to reach 
uh, people of senior age, right? right? Well, there's a set of values and there's a tone and a voice in which you should speak to become attractive to that ideal audience. And when you don't do that, um, and you try to speak in, you know, in a in a in a in a in a voice that's appropriate for a different generation. What happens is a dissonance in those people's minds because they're interested in the content, but they're not really interested in the form that you speak. So it doesn't the the the, the circle of value is not completed. It's as much about the content as it is about the form, you got kind of the packaging, as we would say in in marketing. It's about the presentation as well. Um, and this goes into the valuable, the value of the experience. But now if we focus on the content, are you responding to those questions and those challenges that those people are dealing with? Are you entertaining to them? Are, are you out of the norm or are you just following, you know, the mediocre approach in, uh, in, uh, in the business? I see so many people in business that go for the cheapest approach to their messaging, to their branding, to their marketing materials. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that you have to invest huge amounts in your, in your pieces. However, when you go with the cheapest, you know, you know, I, this is a funny analogy because uh, uh, there's been in our field the whole, you know, the Fiverr, right? So I don't know if you've been to Fiverr or Fiverr with two R's, but it's, it, it's a marketplace in which you can buy things for five dollars. So you can buy a video from a you know a spokesperson. Sorry, you can buy I cut out there, Alex. But you were talking about Fiverr. Yeah, Fiverr. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's a marketplace for things that you can buy for five, just five five dollars, yeah. right? So <laughs> you can buy place. a business card, a website for five dollars, and things like that. Now you have to understand it is a, anything you buy there for five dollars is going to be of the lowest quality. It won't have any research involved. It'll, it'll just be something for you to check the boxes and say, yeah, I'm done with it. Now, if you go to Fiverr right now, you'll see that they no longer offer things for $5. Now things are $25, $125 and above. Plus, they're opening a new marketplace. I think they call it Fiverr Plus or Fiverr Elite or something like that, where it's all about high-end experiences. So even they, where their pitch was, you can get the cheapest here, they're realizing that the cheapest is no longer doing the oh. trick anymore. Yeah, well, it's not a matter of being the lowest cost. Like, honestly, uh, I avoid stuff like that, you know, the low end, because why would you pay? You know you're not going to, or you should know that you're not going to get quality work for five bucks. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But it's, this is, this is a, the approach that will help us see what is a valuable experience that will help others invest their attention in properly and then feel like they made a, a, a good purchase. And I'm talking about a, a transaction of attention, their attention for your valuable experience. Um, yeah. it, it, it's no longer cheap. It's no longer easy. You need to invest either your time, your money, your energy, your focus. You need to have an investment in that asset to develop something that is valued in the marketplace of attention. Excellent. And so you mentioned you started on one for the trade of building your own personal brand. Um, what were the four again that you have? So the let's go for the four challenges. The the, sure. fir the first challenge is irrelevant. Like I said, it's it's no longer relevant to to the type of audience that you're trying to reach. Um, the the other one is synthetic. So synthetic a synthetic personal brand means that it's fabricated. It's artificial. It's not really real anymore. It's just a personal brand that is put out there to fool people into that transaction of attention. But what happens with a synthetic personal brand is that people invest their attention for a moment. And then when they realize that that brand is just synthetic, they get disappointed very quickly. They tune out and most of the time never tune back in. So you really only get one shot in being authentic, and um, and that would be the counterpart. Then the next Can one. You give an example of a synthetic brand. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to name names, but know. but uh, but we've seen it in you know celebrities. We've seen it in CEOs. Actually, let me name one name. Sure. Um, right now. They're probably not um, listening anyway. So. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> If you're paying attention to the business news, you know that the company Uber, yeah. which is Uber successful and Uber famous, but is going through a huge crisis right now. Their former CEO um, has been, you know, discovered with all sorts of scandals. 
um, all sorts of issues with disrespect to the opposite uh, gender, the opposite sex. Uh, they're, they're going through amazing type of turmoil. So this guy, he sold himself as one thing, as being this forward-thinking, progressive uh, leader in business. And for many years, uh, that was the brand that he sold himself. And now he's in the spotlight for being the complete opposite based on uh, witness accounts, based on hidden videos that have come out from him. But now his brand was revealed to be very synthetic. And this has cost him millions of dollars, millions of dollars, this whole issue in his th synthetic brand. Yeah. So that would be the prime example that I would put as, as kind of a warning signal for all of us to say, it's better to be yourself and to come across as yourself than to regret later on uh, when people discover who you really are. Yeah, that would, that would make perfect sense. So yeah, <laughs> get out there and do the right thing as well. And what are some of the other challenges then? Yeah, so so the other challenge is um, I mentioned you know I mentioned a, a, a brand that is um, that is synthetic, and then uh, the other challenge is a brand that is obscure. So obscurity, you know, we talk about attractiveness, and the the um, opposite is usually something that's visible and it's attractive. But I call it obscure, and obscure just means that it's not connecting with your your audience in such a way that they can find you easily. Now, I in the book, I talk about an example of a bee in a whole swarm of bees. Now, one single bee is as visible as all the other bees. Why can't you point out one bee in a swarm of bees? Because they all look the same, right? They move too fast. They move too fast. <laughs> they move too fast. But the point here is that this single bee is no less visible than all the other bees. It's just not you know, it's not um, attractive enough to focus on one B because it's just moving in the exact same pattern and the exact same appearance as all the other Bs. So this is an issue that um, will, you know, really stumps people when they're developing their brand is that their brand remains in obscurity. Nobody ever knows about them. Nobody ever contacts them. Nobody ever reaches out to them because they remain in this obscure status. Um, the other, the other portion, I mentioned irrelevancy, and I want to go through one aspect of irrelevancy. So, yeah. so many people develop a, a, a personal brand, and they start talking about topics that are unrelated to what they do for business. Now, their brand could be, uh, they could be authentic, their brand could be attractive, but they're attractive for all the wrong reasons. Let me give you an example. Let us say you are an attorney, right? Let us say you are a very successful personal injury attorney, just to put a very specific example. What kind However, of accent did I have? <laughs> <laughs> you have a very New York, Brooklyn accent. So, <laughs> no, accident. <laughs> oh, accident. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. Anyway, <laughs> let's just say that you have so many topics that you could talk about related to the way you can help people in a personal injury incident. However, you decide, you decide to, to uh, ask people to invest their attention in politics, in sports, in controversies, and in topics that are unrelated to what you do for business. Now, there's nothing really wrong with that. This isn't like a, a rule against anything. However, when people think about, okay, I had an injury, who am I going to call? They really only remember you for politics, for sports, and controversial topics. They may not remember you for the value that you bring to that marketplace because you never talk about it. So that's an irrelevant brand, and that is the problem in a bad investment. You're, at, you're pitching for a bad investment of other people's attention. But do you, is there sort of a conflict there? Is it, uh you don't want to talk business all the time either, right? Like you, you want to, part of the trend, what we're seeing is businesses and um, with higher profile, they, they're trying to build their personal brand as well. So, you know, where's the balance between building your personal brand and talking talk about your <laughs> is there yeah, no, That is a great question. And it's, it's something that many people are concerned about, mainly, Am I going to burn my audience if I talk about my business all the time, right? Yes. That's, that's a very valid concern. However, 
What I'm saying here is not to be pitching your business all the time. You're not saying every time you speak, you know, call 1-800, you know, Doyle Bueller. Yeah. You're not saying you're well, not going to go get that one. <laughs> go, go, go. go for it. <laughs> you're not pushing your business card in other people's faces. You're not yeah. really doing that, but you're talking about items. And I, I, I kind of like to define in a, in a content strategy, your primary topic, your secondary topic and your, your tertiary topics. And many times your tertiary topics may have nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing to do with your business itself, but it has to do with the values that your business represents, right? And in such a way, then it does have a direct connection. If I talk about, oh, you know, I hate the sports team or blah, 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 it's very difficult to connect that to your value because everybody's talking about sports. Um, everybody is, you know, discussing on this and they naturally have a different brand from you, the brand that you could ever build. But if I talk about, for example, one of the things I like to talk about a lot online and offline is my family. I like to talk about my children. I like to talk about my wife. I'm very proud of, of, of my family and my kids and what we're able to do. But that has a direct connection to my business. Why? Because my business's values are all about ethics, about honesty, about accountability. And those things translate into my family life. And therefore, I understand that that is as relevant as everybody else, as everything else. When somebody, someone hires our firm, they want to work with somebody that is accountable, that is responsible, and I believe my family values reflect that as well. So that's one way not to burn your audience with uh, just talking, quote unquote, business talk all the time. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that makes sense. And, and as well, like you need to be expanding your your audience as well, so they're not always going to be sort of the, the friends and family side of it as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is actually very tough to the other way. Um, so how do we tie this all together? Um, so we have those four challenges. Uh, what, what, what do we need to do next? Yeah, so let's, let's recap. So the four challenges are synthetic, obscure, irrelevant, and unremarkable. And I'm not sure if we, I ever talked about that last one, but unre unremarkable is just something that does not stand out. And I believe people in our day, we, have, we all have the ability to judge quality, to judge you know, the value of something, uh, from wherever we're standing. We know when something's cheap, when something doesn't deserve our attention. So it's just a, a, an att it's just a warning call for us all in our messaging to make sure that what we do is above the unremarkable. It's actually way above the best that we can do. So, so these four, uh, the way to counteract them are the four traits that I, I believe uh, correspond to a solid personal brand. And they all begin with A. So for a synthetic brand, the counterpart is authenticity. You know, instead of being synthetic and fake, it people really want to develop, want to uh, invest their attention in experiences that are real, that are authentic, that are wholesome. Uh, and you know, the integrity is so rare in our time, but when you find it, this this is the type of person that you want to pay attention to. So, a call to be authentic, I think, is very very valid in our day. Um, and and also, like like we said at the beginning, this whole banter about fake news um, has made people really, you know, rethink how, who, which source am I going to pay attention? Um, uh, which source am I going to be devoting my attention to? Because um, at the end of the day, uh, it, again, it's in rare supply. Authentic experiences are just, you know, those type of things that you cannot ignore. Uh, the real, and you know what, Doyle, it's all, all about discovering yourself who you are and putting the best foot forward when, wherever you are so when you understand the values your aspects your personality your story and you start talking from those people will see that there's much more substance to your brand than just pitching business yeah that's pretty existential <laughs> yeah so do you want me to keep through going through yeah, the other absolutely. ones Okay, so yeah. the next one for obscure is being attractive. Now, yeah. attractive, uh, and and I think you did a great job in in uh, in your past life. You've you've really hammered on this point about knowing your audience. Who are you speaking to? Because you're only going to be attractive in the measure that you understand your audience. And one of the phrases that I use is that you should know your audience so well that they think in their mind, man. Doyle has actually, he has to be a mind reader. He is reading my mind because that was, that concern that he's expressing is exactly 
what I had in mind. That concern that he's expressing is what keeps me up at night. And this is our goal as business leaders, entrepreneurs, business owners, is to understand that audience. And our goal is for them to have that thought and say, wow, he's speaking from the heart, but he understands me. He gets me. That's becoming attractive. The next one is irrelevant. Now, the, the counterpart for irrelevant that I use is aligned. And I'm using this term more and more and more. Um, and, and alignment just means that with what you ask people to invest their attention, there is a direct correlation with your business value in such a way that when they remember you, when they pay attention to you, they get what you do and how you can help them. Uh, this is an aligned personal brand. So uh, it's, it's aligned with the sort of the value equation that your audience is expecting. Is that what you mean? Not only what your audience is expecting, because what I've seen is so many people burn their personal brand because they are, again, speaking about uh, topics unrelated to their business value, what they bring to the business marketplace. Yeah. Um, so it's it, the people, unfortunately, in those cases come to expect something that doesn't relate to their business. So let's, for, ex for example, um, I know of a guy that he is in the law space. He's not a personal injury attorney, but he's in the law space. But what he chooses to speak about is about sex. Now, what happens is that people come to expect him to talk about sex, but he doesn't, they don't expect him to talk about the business value that he can bring, which is to refer him to an attorney and things like that. Yeah. So what happens is that when it is time for him to pitch his business, then it takes people aback. It's like, whoa, 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 don't get so businessy on me. Yeah. Because he has not developed a brand that is aligned with his business value. So that's the, that's the way to overcome that, is to okay. find those primary topics, secondary topics, tertiary topics, and really develop that content strategy so that whenever you talk, you're always in alignment with the core of your business. That's and awesome. um, okay. the, fi the final one, the, the, the challenge for being unremarkable, can be overcome by a word that we often misuse and I misuse it, I'm guilty of it, but it's becoming awesome. Oh, but you, you are awesome, Al. <laughs> <laughs> you are too, my friend. But being awesome is, uh, the, the meaning of the word is something that merits awe. It merits appreciation from the marketplace. Now, it's above some. It's above, yep, exactly. It's, it's above the norm, it's above mediocrity. Now, back you know, a few seconds ago, we were talking about you know, the Fiverr economy and, you know, doing things for cheap. Those types of things will never garner somebody to say, wow, that is awesome. That is out of the norm. It's out of the mediocrity. So we need to be very careful because, again, if you only had one shot for people to pay attention to you, you want that shot to be worth it. Uh, now, awesomeness is, is as much about the intellectual uh, portion of the awesomeness as the emotional side. So I'll give you an example of the, the intellectual portion. So in our firm, we have uh, a set of clients. Some clients are ongoing, so they, they pay us by retainer, and some are just one shots. We finish a project and we, we go on. So let's talk so specifically about the clients that we have on retainer. What we used to do was say, hey, we're here. Whenever you need to uh, talk to us, we're on call. We just have to schedule a conversation, and that's it. If we didn't schedule a conversation, we would just continue on with our deliverables. We'd be responsible in whatever we contracted for. Now, that in itself is okay. That's great. It's actually above the norm, you know, for somebody to fulfill their work, right? However, we've moved on to a model where we proactively reach out to our clients and we say, hey, let's have a, a mid-month meeting, and if we need to have an end-of-month meeting, we'll have that as well. But let's schedule a mid-month meeting every single month to see how our campaign is going and if we need to tweak anything until the end of the month, we can do so as well. We've realized that just doing that has increased our awesomeness uh, points in our client's mind almost threefold. Okay. And, and, and the strange thing about this is that our meetings, our mid-monthly meeting, which can be 30 to 45 minutes, sometimes an hour, became less time invested on our part than what we used to do, which was to be on call nights and weekends and all this thing. And it's more profitable, and it's a much better experience for our clients. 
So awesomeness is not just about the way you sell before the sale, the, uh, the sale before you contract, but it's also the, the experience that you give your clients while you're working together and after you've worked together. Yeah, fantastic. And I actually heard a, a, a story of one service provider, and I won't give names, but they actually had to be paid extra to have, you know, a regular meeting and I was like taken aback. It's like what? You exactly. Do that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and that's it's that's the whole communicate with your customer. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's what a great advice for any business owner, entrepreneur, any business leader listening right now is think about what are those things that really don't cost you anything but can add perceived value to your service that you can incorporate into your standard service and therefore make your uh, your value much more awesome to your to your audience. And so, how do we ooze awesomeness like you, Alex? <laughs> how do we how do we have awesome? No, nah, like me. No, no, no. Um, you know, again, these are types of things that vary depending on the industry. And people from from varying industries should really think about you know what what they're doing um, and how again how can we add those those values? And and again. I think the whole key here is to understand that uh, increasing your perceived value doesn't necessarily mean that you are increasing your cost. And this is where I think a lot of people get trumped by is that they say, well, I want to increase my value to, to my clients and my audience, but I don't want to invest more because I'm hardly profitable right now. Um, and just sitting down and looking at what you're currently providing um, really, it, um, you can you can definitely find, and obviously there's a, this is why mentorship and coaching. Um, uh, some of us coach people to to find those things, but it takes really sitting down and and analyzing what what can I do to increase value. And sometimes it it relates to content. So for example, we have content that is never shared with the world. It's only shared to our clients. Now those content pieces are assets that are not built for client acquisition, but they're built. To, to increase perceived value of our current clients. Now, this is one, one of those things that you record or you develop or you know you design one time and it ends up paying, kind of the gift that keep, keeps on giving, as they say over here. Um, so so this, is the, this is, I think, is the key to being awesome is to find those things that don't cost you more uh, or cost a one-time investment but can increase that awesomeness in people's eyes. Yeah, and, and that people aren't expecting. Yeah, no, fantastic. Exactly. Yeah, um, some brilliant ideas there, Alex, and insights. Uh, love to get into the the mind of other people out there and see what's see what's shaking. <laughs> yeah, um, I got got some cool messages here. I've been watching them up. Thanks, so for, um I don't know if you saw all out, Alex, but I do want to bust down the door and crash this party and crank. Congratulate the book on your upcoming new book. <laughs> right there, wow! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll make him jealous. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. Thank you, Over. And um, Jan Barbosa has been actually been a phenomenal on this episode. He's produced a lot of comments and questions and that sort of thing. So thanks, uh, Jan, as well. And actually, do you, do you two know each other? Uh, I don't think I've had the honor, no. Okay, well, I'm connect with you guys. Actually, Jan is in uh, Puerto Rico uh, oh, right now. Cool. So um, anyway, cool. Well, so, so thank you so much, Alex, for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, what's the best way we can get in touch with you? Well, for our firm, it's ymmymarketing.com, ymmymarketing.com. You can and see you all say about that our yummy or ymm? Yeah, you, we, we call it yummy. But okay. for people typing in, uh, they'll always insert the U there. Uh, but uh, ymmymarketing.com. You can find more about my book at digitalbaconbook.com. And, um, and then uh, about.me slash A-L-X-R-O-D-Z. And that's, uh, you'll find all my social channels there and where to connect with me. I would love to connect with anybody from your audience and uh, answer any follow-up questions. I'm always here available. Yeah, and, cool. uh, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor. Always good to have you as a great connection. You are, you are being an example of everything that we're talking about here. And I really admire what you're doing. Oh, well, thank you. That, that gets uh, a couple of faces for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and we'll have the links in the uh, Facebook notes articles uh, that will be below there as well. So, uh, once again, Alex, thank you so much. Uh, for everybody out there, thanks for watching. Uh, typically, there's three categories that I go through as part of my digital leadership uh, breakthrough 
uh, show with the state of digital where I talk about specific ideas and insights happening there right now and how they affect your business and what you could do about it. Digital leadership guests is on Wednesday where I interview an expert in the field and discuss their strategy for the success. Of the day. I have a wonderful opportunity uh, to learn some amazing things from Alex. And then finally, I have digital discovery question and answer uh, where we talk about strategies, what challenges might be holding you back, what tools and that sort of thing. So thanks again for watching. Uh, please like, leave a question or comment, and uh, we will see you online at a fantastic day.